All right, ninja nerds, in this video, we're gonna talk specifically about the lumbar plexus. Okay, so the lumbar plexus is very important and we'll provide a little clinical correlation to it also. All right, now, if we look at the actual lumbar plexus, it's gonna be coming, usually it actually starts at about T12 actually. We actually include T12, so let's put this down here. We got T12, all right? We're also going to have L1, L2, L3, L4, and L5. Now, T12 is actually going to give off a branch called the subcostal nerve. Okay, so T12 will actually be giving off a branch here, right? And this main nerve of T12 is going to be the subcostal nerve. It actually runs underneath the inferior border of the 12th rib. That's why they call it the subcostal nerve. Now, the subcostal nerve is important because one of the things about the subcostal nerve is the subcostal nerve is going to give motor supply. So it has uh, two destinations of motor supply. One of the motor supplies that it actually brings is it's actually gonna go and supply specifically what's called the pyramidalis. So the pyramidalis. And the pyramidalis is important because it's one of the actual abdominal wall muscles, very, very deep muscle. And what the pyramidalis muscle is actually doing is, is it's tensing this aponeurotic connective tissue sheath running down in the abdominal wall. It's called the linea alba. So it's actually responsible for tensing the actual linea alba. Another branch of the subcostal nerve is gonna go to one of the other deep abdominal wall muscles called the transverse abdominis. So it's also gonna give another branch off, and this is gonna be going to the transverse abdominis. Okay. Sweet deal. That's the subcostal nerve. It does provide some cutaneous sensation, but we're not gonna talk about that. Okay, L1. L1 is going to be important because one of the main things that's coming off L1 is gonna be the ilioinguinal and the iliohypogastric, and we'll talk about those. So let's see how I bring L1. And the primary nerve that's actually coming off of L1 is going to be the ilioinguinal inguinal nerve. Now what's important about this? One second. There's another nerve which is actually going to pick up some of the fibers from T12 and it's also going to pick up some fibers from L1. So this is going to pick up some of the fibers from T12 and it's going to pick up some of the fibers from L1 and it's going to form this nice little nerve. And this nerve is called the ilio hypo gastric nerve. Okay? Ilio hypogastric nerve. Now, the ilio hypo gastric nerve is really cool because, again, it can actually have cutaneous branches and it can have motor branches. So, for the ilio hypo gastric nerve, let's actually branch it out here into two different things. It's going to have a cutaneous supply and it's gonna have a motor supply. Now, for the iliohypogastric nerve, it supplies cutaneously two different areas. One is it's gonna supply the skin over the pubis, okay? So it's gonna supply the skin over the pubis, and it's gonna supply the skin of the lateral buttocks, okay, or the booty cheeks. So it's gonna supply the skin above pubis, and it's also gonna supply the skin on lateral buttocks. All right. So that's the iliohypogastric nerve, okay? Then motor supply. The motor supply of the iliohypogastric nerve is actually gonna be going to the internal oblique. So it'll actually supply the internal oblique and it'll supply the transverse abdominis. Okay, so this is actually going to supply the internal oblique and it's going to supply the transverse abdominis. Now, if you guys know a little bit about your uh, physiology of these muscles, you'll know that the transverse abdominis is actually going to be responsible for helping whenever it contracts, it compresses some of the contents within the abdomen to increase the intra-abdominal pressure, to push on the diaphragm to assist during the forced expiratory process. 
whereas the internal oblique is going to be one of the actual skeletal muscles that are going to be primarily responsible for flexing the vertebral column. So they play a role with inflection of the vertebral column. And they compress the contents of the abdomen to assist in the forced expiratory process. Now, the inguinal nerve is going to have two branches. One is going to be a cutaneous branch, and the other one is going to be a motor branch. So it's going to have a cutaneous supply, and it's going to have a motor supply. The cutaneous of the ilioinguinal nerve, it's going to be primarily supplying, okay? If you're looking at the ilioinguinal nerve, this is going to be having cutaneous sensation also. So the ilioinguinal nerve is actually going to supply the skin on the proximal and medial part of the thigh. So it's going to be supplying the skin on the proximal medial part of the thigh. So it's going to supply the skin of proximal and medial thigh. And it's also going to give cutaneous sensation to some of the actual external genitalia-like structures. So for example, in the male, it will supply the scrotum, the upper part of the scrotum. It'll also supply the root of the penis, so some of the skin on the root of the penis. And for the female, it's also going to supply certain structures there. So for the female, it actually will give uh, cutaneous sensation to the mons pubis. You know the mons pubis is the fatty uh, region, okay? And that's the fatty rounded region. And it's actually going to supply the skin over the mons pubis. And it's also going to supply the labia majora, okay? That's the ilioinguinal nerve. The ilioinguinal nerve can give a little bit of supply to the internal oblique and the transverse abdominis too, okay? So it can give a little bit of motor supply to the internal oblique and a little bit to the transverse abdominis. But primarily, this is going to be more of an actual cutaneous nerve. So we'll put a little asterisk next to this. It's ma mainly a cutaneous supply. But it does have a little bit of motor supply that can give to the internal oblique and the transverse abdominis. Okay, now let's go to the next one. Now we're going to come to the next branch, which is going to be called the genitofemoral nerve. And I'm going to give you guys a nice little mnemonic here in a little bit to help you guys with this process here. Okay, so let's come here. And now what happens is, let's do this one in green. If I bring this branch here, I bring L1 and L2 together. So I'm going to bring L1 and L2 together. If I bring these guys together, this is going to form another nerve, which is actually going to be coming off of the anterior division. Okay, so it's coming off the anterior division of the lumbar plexus. So let's actually put this here. This is coming off the anterior division of the lumbar plexus. This nerve is going to be specifically called the genitofemoral nerve. And the genitofemoral nerve is pretty much what it, you can actually hear it within the name. It has cutaneous and motor supply. So the cutaneous is pretty much similar to the ilioinguinal. So if you think about the cutaneous for this guy, it's actually going to supply the scrotum in the male. All right, so within the male, it's obviously going to supply the scrotum. And within the female, it's going to supply the labia majora. And it's also going to supply the anterior thigh. But it's going to supply the skin of the anterior thigh that's going to be just below the middle inguinal region. Okay? So it's going to supply the anterior thigh superior to middle inguinal region, okay? Motor supply though, what's important about the motor supply? It supplies one of the muscles that actually helps to elevate those testes, the ball bag, right? So it helps to, uh, the cremaster muscle. So the cremaster muscle, this, this muscle is really funny, so it helps to be able to supply the cremaster muscle. So again, it supplies the cremaster muscle, which helps to elevate the testes. So if you look at the genital femoral nerve, it has motor supply to the cremaster muscle, which elevates the testes, and has cutaneous supply to the scrotum, the labia majora, and the anterior thigh just superior to the middle inguinal region. 
All right, sweet deal. Then let's bring another branch here. Let's have L3. It's actually going to have some fibers that will be picked up with L2. So now look at this. I'm going to have some fibers from L3 come up here and supply L2. So L2 and L3 will come together. Let's actually make this line a little bit nicer here. And it's going to give fibers to L2. And this will come together and this will form this important nerve. And this nerve is actually called the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. And you can obviously tell by the name of this nerve that it's only going to be having cutaneous supply. What is the cutaneous supply? It's going to be mainly supplying the lateral thigh. Pretty much it. So it's supplying the lateral thigh. And it does give sensory cutaneous supply to what's called the peritoneum, which is a double layered uh, serous membrane. And it's actually going to house some of the actual gastrointestinal organs that we'll talk about within the GI. Okay, so it's going to have cutaneous sensation to the lateral thigh and to the peritoneum. Now, here's a kind of a, a next little one here. So we've gone over iliohypogastric nerve, ilioinguinal nerve, genitofemoral, lateral femoral cutaneous. Now we're going to do another one. This one is going to be picking up fibers from L2. So it's actually going to be picking up fibers from L2 it's going to be picking up fibers from L3, and it's going to pick up fibers from L4. Let's actually draw L4 right here. Okay, so it's also going to be picking up fibers from L4. So let's have them moving through here and picking up fibers here. So if I have this nice little blue nerve here, this is a really important nerve because as this nerve is, is leaving, it's actually going to be a part of the uh, anterior division here. This is actually a part of the anterior division of the, specifically what? Anterior division of the lumbar plexus. So this is going to be coming off the anterior division. This nerve will actually come off and move through a nice little hole here. What is this hole here that it moves through? It moves through a hole here which is called the, one of the biggest holes in the body. This is called the obturator foramen. So it'll move through a nice little hole called the obturator foramen. What do you think this nerve is? Obturator nerve. Okay, so this is actually called the obturator nerve. This is called the obturator nerve. Now the obturator nerve supplies many, many, many different structures. Before we go over that, let's do one other nerve. Now this nerve is actually going to come as kind of an accessory branch of the obturator nerve. But it doesn't come from L2. It only comes from L3 and L4. So it's only going to be picking up fibers from L3 and it's going to be picking up fibers from L4. This is actually called the accessory obturator nerve. So this one is actually called the accessory obturator nerve. Now, the accessory obturator nerve is going to be in 30% of certain patient cases you're actually going to find this nerve. And what this nerve does is it's actually going to supply cutaneous supply. It's mainly going to be having a cutaneous branch. And the cutaneous branch is going to be specifically going to the hip joint. So it's going to be supplying the skin around the hip joint. Okay, so it's really, really good for cutaneous supply to the hip joint. It's also going to have motor fibers. And these motor fibers are actually going to be primarily supplying what's called the pectineus muscle. So it's called supplying the pectineus muscle, which is an important muscle for flexion at the hip. Okay? The obturator nerve supplies so many different structures. We're going to talk about him in just a second. Let me actually move and bring L5 in here, okay, out of the way here. So now I'm going to bring the obturator nerve just a little bit more down here so we can talk about what it's supplying because it supplies a lot of different structures here. Okay, so the obturator nerve is actually going to supply many, many different types of structures. So it has two different uh, supplies. It obviously is going to have cutaneous supply 
and it's going to have motor supply. So if it is cutaneous, it's going to mainly be supplying the actual medial thigh. So it's going to supply the medial thigh. So this is actually going to give cutaneous sensation to the medial thigh. Pretty simple for this one. It's primarily only going to give cutaneous sensation to the medial thigh. The motor supply, though, is going to supply a lot of different muscles. So the obturator nerve, it can actually supply what? Let's actually look here at the obturator nerve. It can supply the adductor muscles. So for example, the adductor longus, the adductor magnus, the adductor brevis. It can even supply the gracilis. So it can supply these muscles here. And it even can supply the obturator externus. So it can have a lot of different muscles that this guy supplies, right? So it can supply the adductor longus, adductor magnus, adductor brevis, which are all adductor muscles. It supplies the gracilis, which helps to perform flexion at the hip. It also helps to perform adduction, and it can even rotate the hip, right? All right. That's the obturator nerve, right? Now, so we've gone over the accessory obturator. We've gone over the obturator. Let's do another really important nerve here. Let's do this one in pink. Okay. So we're going to actually, no, we'll do it in black, but we'll write the things in pink here. Now, this nerve is really important. This nerve is actually going to be getting branches from L4. It's going to be picking up branches from L3. And it's also going to be picking up branches from L2. So it picks up branches from L2, L3, and L4, and this is going to form one of the really, really important nerves here, which is called the femoral nerve. So this is going to supply the, this is going to form what's called the femoral nerve, which is actually coming for the posterior division of this part right here, so femoral nerve. Now what's important about the femoral nerve is that it's actually going to have cutaneous supply, but they actually kind of give a little name to these branches here. So one of the branches of the femoral nerve is for the cutaneous. So it has cutaneous supply. One of the cutaneous branches is actually called the anterior femoral cutaneous branch. And you can obviously tell what this is going to supply. <laughs> this one will supply primarily the anterior It'll supply the anterior and a little bit of the lateral aspect of the thigh. So this supplies anterior and lateral sensations from the thigh. The other branch is going to be what's called the saphenous branch. The saphenous branch. And the saphenous branch is actually going to be a really cool one because it supplies the medial hip joint. It supplies the medial thigh, the medial aspect of the knee joint. It supplies the medial aspect of the calf, and even the medial aspect of the heel. So a lot of different cutaneous sensation from this branch of the femoral nerve. So you can imagine if there was any damage to the femoral nerve, the type of paresthesia that you would experience from that guy. Now, like anything, it has motor supply. Son of a gun. Let's bring this facial nerve, I'm sorry, a facial nerve, femoral nerve here. Let's have another part over here. And this is obviously going to be the motor supply. But we're going to do this in red. And this is going to be the motor supply. He supplies a boatload of muscles. That's why if there is ever any types of herniated discs or some type of situation where there's compression of the femoral nerve, it could affect the way the person has the ability to walk. Why? Because the motor supply is out, 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 out ridiculous. It supplies the iliacus, which is a prime mover for flexion it, uh, at the hip. It also supplies with the pectineus, which is also another mover for flexion at the hip. It supplies the quadriceps femoris. And for those of you who know that, it consists of the vastus, medialis, lateralis, and intermedius, and you'll know that these all do extension at the knee, and it actually consists of the rectus 
femoris, right? And a really big one is the sartorius muscle. It also supplies the sartorius muscle. And if you know the rectus femoris can do, flexion at the hip and extension of the knee. The sartorius can flex the knee, can flex the hip, and it can even do rotation of the hip, primarily that of uh, lateral rotation. So you can see here that if the femoral nerve is actually damaged, what could actually, again, what could actually cause the compression of this femoral nerve? One of the more common causes is going to be some type of herniated disc. Herniated disc within, around the region of L2, L3, and L4. That's why it's important sometimes to actually know what branches are supplying this nerve. Because if you have a herniated disc within this region here, what, what is a herniated disc? You know, if I actually have here, let's say here, I draw a vertebrae. Let's say here's a vertebrae here, just the body of it. Here's a vertebrae here. And then you have this structure here in the middle. It's like a jelly-like material. It's called, let's actually do this in a different color because let's do the annulus fibrous within a different color. Let's have here this jelly-like material, which is actually derived from the, the notochord. It's actually called the nucleus pulposus, right? So the nucleus pulposus is actually gonna be this jelly-like material derived from the notochord. And around it, you're actually gonna have these interweaving fibers right here, which is made up of a lot of collagen. They call this the annulus fibrous, fibrosis, right? So the annulus fibrosis, and this is gonna consist of a lot of cartilage, fibrocartilage primarily, right? When these spinal nerves, so this is actually where the spinal nerves run through, right? They run through that intervertebral foramen right here, right? They run through there. If there's some type of bulging, let's say by for whatever some situation there's too much compression, there's some type of situation in which this actual nucleus pulposus is herniated out. And if it is herniated out from that annulus fibrous connective tissue, that fibrocartilage, right? What can it do? It can compress these nerves. And if it compresses these nerves, what can happen? It can affect the actual motor supply. So what might happen with these people? They might, not have, they might have a hard time being able to, obviously from a lot of the flexors of the hip, they might have a, have a hard time being able to flex at the hip. They might also have loss or paresthesia, so they might have pain, numbness, tingling within the, a lot of these different areas. So the medial aspect of the hip joint, the medial aspect of the thigh, the medial knee, the medial calf, the medial heel, the anterior and lateral thigh, a lot of different things can be coming from that femoral nerve, right? Okay, so this could be one of the big things. And also, if the femoral nerve is, if for whatever reason, it's uh, due to this herniated disc, what else could happen? It could affect them being able to walk. So they might have a strange gait, like of walk, because it's affecting the primary flexors of the hip. All right, one more branch here. And this is gonna lead into our next video that we're gonna have on the sacral plexus, is L4 and L5 are actually going to come together. And when L4 and L5 come together, they form this nice thick like trunk. And this thick trunk here is actually called the lumbosacral trunk. So this, is, this right here is actually called the lumbosacral trunk. This is really important because this is gonna lead into the sacral plexus. All right, this is called the lumbosacral trunk. Okay. And so again, this is pretty much giving us the entire lumbar plexus. Now, let me give you a quick little mnemonic to help you to remember most of the branches. It's not gonna cover all of them, but it's gonna cover the major branches. So it kind of goes like this. And there's different versions out there trying to provide the most you know, sensible one, not inappropriate. So it goes I twice got lost on freeways. And again, this is the main branches, okay? So I'm going to put in parentheses twice here. So I twice, so there's two I's. What is those two I's? One of them is going to be ilio, hypogastric, then twice ilio, inguinal, got genitofemoral, Lost lateral femoral cutaneous on obturator and F femoral. So these are the main branches of the lumbar plexus, right? 
So I just wanted to give you that little mnemonic because that can kind of help you out to really, really get that down and then you can focus more on specifically what like actual branches are coming from the lumbar plexus. And you can focus a little bit more on what actually is it supplying. All right, Ninja Nerds. So in this video, we did cover a lot of information. We covered the lumbar plexus in great detail. We covered all the branches. We covered the cutaneous and the motor supply, and we covered the more common uh, clinical correlations with that being that of herniated disc or any type of trauma or damage or lesion that can develop within the L2, L3, L4 region. Obviously can damage the femoral nerve and if this lesion develops a little bit more anteriorly, it can affect the obturator nerve. And that could also cause a lot of problems too, all right? All right, engineers, I hope all this made sense. I hope you guys did enjoy it. If you did like it, please hit the like button, comment down in the comment section, and please subscribe. All right, engineers, as always, until next time.